Hi, I'm Dr. Patricia Robin Woodruff. I use she, her pronouns, and I hope to be able to unteach you because there's some things you need to get out of your head before you can put some new ones in there, like how religions developed. I've discovered lots of new things, but I'll keep this presentation to four main points. First, the secret to the formation of all the major Western religions originates in the Slavic lands, also called Old Europe. The second point is the native religion of Old Europe goes back in a continuous line to the Paleolithic Stone Age, and it is the indigenous religion of the land. The variations of deities sprung out of this soil like a tree, just as many separate languages sprung from Proto-Indo-European. Finally, the predominant religions of today share the commonality of these ancient roots. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a priestess of Stone Circle Wicca USA. And in the course of my studies, we were encouraged to avoid cultural appropriation in our spiritual path and instead research the pre-Christian beliefs of our ancestors. As a genealogist, I was most interested in my maternal line of ancestors, which traced back to the Carpathian Mountains to a little known ethnicity of Wemco. The Wemcos were Highlanders and their land is on the mountain peaks. Since mountain ranges are often treated as a border, their lands have been claimed by many countries over the centuries, Galatia, Slovakia, Ukraine, and it's now part of Poland. I started out studying pagan beliefs in the Slavic lands, or I should say in the lands now inhabited by Slavic speaking peoples. Archeologist Maria Gambudis described this area as old Europe. I have to say, I started my work unaware of the research done by Gambudis, but as I worked, I started to find my independent conclusions paralleling hers. It's very exciting to be able to both confirm her findings and find my work in such prestigious company. Gimbutas used the term old Europe because if I use the term Slavic lands, Slavic is defined by its language. And we're talking about a time before the languages split. Essentially, we're starting in the era of proto-proto Indo-European. Now, I've been so buried in my studies, I haven't been able to squeeze in learning all the Slavic languages too. So like any person who has learned primarily from the written word, I may not always have the correct pronunciation. For example, in 2017, in the course of researching folk tales and superstitions in Poland, I stayed with a group of Polish folks in a hotel in the Karkonosa Mountains. When I asked them how to pronounce the name of the hotel, they just looked at me like I was dim, replying, it's pronounced just the way it's spelled, Quinic. Uh, if I pronounce it just the way it's spelled, I would say Chujnik. So I've tried to learn the correct pronunciations, but once in a while, because I've read it way more than I've spoken it, you may get the equivalent of Chujnik. In the course of these studies, I experienced a spirit-led initiation as a Wemko Basorka, which is a type of shamanic witch. Now, there are still so many that believe that a witch is a bad thing, but a witch is essentially a priestess of the old religion. One could also be described as a shamanic worker, or most of these titles for witch or shaman, when translated, means one who knows or wise one. I work with the goal of being an interfaith minister to create understanding and respect for the indigenous earth-based religion of old Europe. This brings me to my first point. Conventional teaching states that religions evolved from original belief in many land spirits called animism. And that turned into a belief in personified deities that were organized into pantheons, like the Greeks, 
Romans, and Norse. And then replacing that was the belief in the one true God as the pinnacle of religious thought. And that was kind of my thinking too when I went into this. In 2015, I started reading up on Slavic native faith beliefs called Radnovri, Runvira, Steraverci, etc. And I found what looked like your classical pantheon. Now, classically trained medieval scholars had started to reconstruct a Slavic pantheon with traditional family structures, just like the Greeks and Romans had. They inserted Rod or Perun, the thunder god, as a head god, found a few pretty goddesses that took care of hearth and home. Rod married Razanitsa and they had a daughter, Lada, etc. Perun fights the god of the underworld, Velez, who steals his cattle and his wife and so forth. I never heard of any of these. I was starting with very few preconceptions and wanted to read everything. But scholars had not studied these deities much because there wasn't much written. No scribe had written down the mythological stories in detail or embroidered the tales with his own inventions. What we had was hidden in the folklore of plant names, oral fairy tales, the lyrics of sacred songs, the symbols painted on eggs, and embroidery, and superstitions. What I found when I went looking is a huge logic puzzle. Did you ever do the logic puzzle like Einstein's riddle, where there's five houses of different colors next to each other? And in each house lives a man of a different nationality, and every man has his favorite drink, a certain pet, etc. There are several clues, and eventually you had enough clues to figure it out. This was the kind of logic puzzle I was working on, but with hundreds of deities' names. One of my big breakthroughs came from studying the name of the bear. Did you know that the real name of the bear was lost? And this is because of a pagan belief that the word is very, very powerful. Fairy tales tell us if you know the true name of the thing, that gives you power over it, like Rumpelstiltskin. But it also means if you speak the true name, you will call the thing towards you. The bear was a sacred animal, and like all the sacred animals, they used nicknames or kennings instead of his real name. In Slavic lands, they used medved, which means honey eater, or burr, the brown one. And that's where our name for the bear comes from. The bear could also be referred to respectfully as grandmother or uncle, but it's a word that means the brother of one's mother specifically. And these last two nicknames tell us that these beliefs go back to matriarchal cultures where the grandmother or maternal uncle holds more status. These titles go back to pre-agriculture hunter-gatherer times. But it hit me, if the name of the bear is too sacred to say, then they're not going to be using the name of the deity. Going back to my notes, I found that most researchers started off by saying what the deity's name meant. Perun means the striker, or to strike like lightning. Lada means maiden. Jiva means life. While Jibug means life god. And I realized none of these are names. They are all titles. You may have heard that the Hebrew name of God was lost because God is just another title. They use the initials YHWH, which could be pronounced Jehovah or Yahweh. And just as I have been called by many different titles in my life, such as daughter, wife, mother, priestess, doctor, friend. These titles are all referring to the same entity. And this same taboo against using the real name goes for the Slavic deities as well. The reason I felt I was led to start with a pair of Jiva and Jibug is because once I went looking, I found that essentially 
all the titles of deities came in pairs. Lada and Lado, meaning the maiden and her lad. Perun and Perunika, meaning the striker or thunderer, and the thunderer with a female ending. Because of the work of Maria Gambudis and other scholars, archeologists have been slowly shifting from their assumed head god to the paleolithic fact of the predominance of the goddess. We see this in a vast quantity of goddess figures. For most of prehistory, the cultures were matrifocal. Now, this does not mean patriarchal, but with women in charge. This means a mindset where the lineage is traced through the mother. There is no ownership form of marriage. Jobs are based on skill rather than gender. There are very little possessions and resources are shared and distributed. So we can tell which are the older variations of the titles. Perun with a Perun-like goddess is a male-centric way to view the couple. The terms we use today are usually male-centric. I am a womb man, a female man, or a priestess, a female priest. We see in the older terms, the god Des, Jiva, who is life, but it is Jibug who is the derivative life god. The oldest terms would be the female, La Da, and a balanced male, La Do, or Yarela and Yarelo. Archaeologist Maria Gambudis illustrated the importance of the goddess with all those Paleolithic female figures. But something that Gambudis missed, since she was struggling so hard to gain some respect for the goddess, is that ultimately the god and goddess were first thought to be united into one dual sexed entity. Consequently, those who incorporated both genders were revered because they were in touch with the primal divine force. Hence, we have the cross-dressing priestesses or those of liminal gender serving in this sacred role. In the ancient Vinci culture, there are anthropomorphic figures representing the great mother and her male companion. We then have the male and female aspect of deity multiplying. Earth religions view life and the seasons in a circular manner and the earth deities change with the seasons. We can see that the herding cultures divided the year in two, summer and winter. During the warm time of the year, they took their flocks to the grassy mountains. And during the cold time of the year, they hunkered down in their homes in the lowlands. The word for summer comes from the same Proto-Indo-European Proto root as the word sum, to add things up to make a whole. Places like Serbia still practice this transhumanate herding lifestyle, and their new year is celebrated at the cross-quarter day of May 1st, when they take their herds to the mountains. In Celtic lands, this would be the holiday of Beltan. And in Slavic lands, this is a celebration of life and love when Jiva and her partner are celebrated and she is crowned with flowers. And this is where the tradition of Mary crowned with flowers at the beginning of May comes from. The reign of summer ends at the cross quarter day at the beginning of November. The Celts call this Samhain, which means summer's end. While in Slavic lands, it is looked upon as a time to honor the dead ancestors. Just as the land looks completely different in the summertime than in the wintertime, so too the earth deities will look very different in their summer guise and winter guise. So in some places, the goddess is remembered in a dual form like Veli Diva. That is two goddess names combined, Velonia, the goddess of death and winter, and Deva or Jiva, the goddess of life and summer. 
we have Velika, or Valonia, and Velez, who take care of winter and the dead. They can also be called Mora and Moran or Moravit. Mor means death, dark, and sea, since the ancient concept is that the underworld is a watery place. The second part of Veli Diva is her summertime component. We see the summertime couple as Deva and Devach, also called Jiva and Jibug. Remember, Jiva means life. Once the circular concept of reincarnation was forgotten, then Valonia and Deva were seen as sisters. This separated them into two different deities rather than two phases of the same goddess. So already we've multiplied our divine couple into Deva and Devach, Jiva and Jibug, Mora and Moran, and a few variations on their titles, including that composite title of Veli Diva. This is a photo from a sacred Neolithic site called Triglavka Cave in Devacha, Slovenia. I got to visit here with my friend and fellow researcher, Boris Chok. You see here the stalagmite shaped like the goddess with a bowl for sacred water in her womb. And above her is the stalactite of Devach. This cave also has three stalactites at the cave entrance, which symbolizes the three faces of the goddess. Now at some point, a tripartite year developed in Slavic and Germanic cultures. This may have been upon the advent of agriculture when an earlier start to the year was needed for planting. But the year then became divided into the springing time, summer through harvest, and the winter resting time. This gave us the triple goddess and her partner, the triple god, who wasn't quite as well remembered. In the last slide, we saw the cave Triglavka. Triglav means three-headed. The triple goddess is called Trigla, and her partner is Triglav. They can be seen as the springtime couple, Yurella and Yurello, the summertime and harvest couple, Peronika and Perun, and as the goddess of death and rebirth, Valonia and Velez until they are viewed again as the young spring couple. This is a medieval drawing of the three-headed Trigla. And at the top of this carved staff, there are three faces. We see Yurillo, the older face is Perun, and then we have Velez represented by a skull. But remember, he is also the god of rebirth. Trigla and Triglav, can also be called Troya and Troyan or Trojan. We know the original name for the city of Troy was Troya, and I believe the land there was named after this goddess. Here's an illustration of the Temple of Remuva, where they had images of Petulus, Percunus, and Petrimpus. I know I'm throwing a lot of names at you, but stay with me here. Variations of this triple god can be seen on the flag of Widvito with an image of Peckles, Percunus, and Petrimpo. These are just different titles for Velez, Perun, and Urillo. I've written my thesis outlining this logic puzzle of names for the triple god, which is available at academia.edu. And in this paper, I discuss how Velez was eventually called Vulcan, Hades, Mercury, Jiva, and Odin as well. Now you have seen how the Neolithic dual sexed deity has multiplied into male and female. And then those male and female sets have accumulated different titles through two seasons and then three seasons forming the concept of the triple goddess and the triple god. 
This illustrates how the triple god began to accumulate various titles. So congratulations. You now know all these deities formed from the same dual sexed deity and that all their names are actually titles. But let's go back to the indigenous beliefs that started during the Stone Age. And here's one of those facts to unlearn. Stone Age people were not stupid. They had just as much of a brain as you or I and a lot more time to observe nature. Modern folks think that they were stupid because they didn't invent agriculture. But you need to understand there was no point. I remember hearing uh, about a TED talk, um, a story of an Italian man who went to Libya to try to improve the natives way of life. He planted these tomatoes in the fertile soil and they were doing great until the crop was destroyed by hungry and trampling hippos. Likewise, our ancestors didn't cultivate farms, but it wasn't because they didn't know how. They knew a seed grew into a plant, but until the demise of the megafauna, there was no point. If you think hippos are a problem, try to fence out a six ton woolly mammoth. We have sculpted stone goddess figures dating to 35,000 BCE, which is while Neanderthals were still around Europe. But you can see that agriculture couldn't really begin until the megafauna were gone around 11,000 BCE. Now at that point, we have a mix of hunter-gatherers, agriculturalists, and herders. What winds up happening with agriculture is people begin to accumulate wealth. This is in the form of grain or livestock. And with wealth and possessions, we get groups attacking one another to acquire those possessions. And this winds up bringing about the rise of the warrior culture, as well as hierarchy, patriarchy, and the ownership form of marriage to ensure paternity. This means we begin to see cities, walled cities, wheeled carts to attack others, and the rise of hierarchies. So let's talk about how the environment affected religion. This is an image during the last ice age, around 19,000 BCE, where the glaciers come down into Germany, Poland, Belarus, and all along the top half of Russia. Note where the green fertile land is, Spain, France, Italy, and all those lands we now call Slavic. And below them is a wide strip of grasslands and desert. For the indigenous people of old Europe, life was good. The land was fertile, the goddess of life was happy and generous. Her body was the earth and it produced everything that her children needed. She was their mother and the mother of the animals. People could find fish aplenty in the streams, pick fruits and nuts from the trees. The trees provided inner bark, which could be fashioned into fiber for cord and eventually clothing and shoes. And this is why one of her symbols was the tree of life, giving us all that we needed. Now this is an animated map of the, the last ice age, starting in 19,000. BCE. What I want to draw your attention to is the short period of time when the desert area was fertile around 6,500 BCE and it lasted until about 1,000 BCE. Say right there. And the second really important thing to notice is the Black Sea area was a fertile valley with a freshwater lake. And around 4000 BCE, it turns into a saltwater sea. This information is based on the relatively recent Black Sea hypothesis 
by geologists Pittman and Ryan. In researching the area around there, Pittman and Ryan saw signs that when the glaciers were melting, a point came when the Mediterranean flooded into this valley and in a relatively short period of time formed the Black Sea. The people in this area, the size of Ireland, were pushed out. This caused all kinds of conflicts over territory, changing trade routes and shifting the center of culture down into Turkey and the Levant, which at that point was all nice and green. This may have carried the tale of the great flood to the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Hebrews in the earliest written account, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now think about the beginnings of what we call civilization. Where do you think the earliest wheel was found? How about the earliest gold culture? Egypt maybe? Earliest copper working? Earliest writing? Maybe Mesopotamia or Samaria? Earliest ceramics? Well, the oldest wheel was found in the Ljubljana marshes in Slovenia, dating to 3150 BCE. While well, almost simultaneously, the use of the wheel is thought to have occurred in Mesopotamia. Our earliest gold culture, Varna, Bulgaria, 4600 BCE. How about the earliest writing? Sumerians? Minoans, it is the Danube script or the Vinca script in either Ribbon, Bulgaria or Tartaria, Romania around 5,300 BCE. And the earliest copper working is in Serbia around 5,500 BCE. The earliest ceramics on the edge of Chechia dating back to 29,000 BCE. And what do our oldest ceramics depict? A goddess figure. Now, most people don't think of old Europe as the cradle of civilization, but you can see all of these early developments happened in this area first. Then when Mesopotamia, Babylonia, and Egypt became fertile, and the Black Sea flooded, the focus then shifted. The holy writing of this matriarchal culture becomes used by patriarchal run kingdoms to write down their verbal history and keep the accounting of their property. This gives the mistaken impression that they developed writing. Now, before we have kingdoms and a primary male god, how does your viewpoint change? when you have a nurturing, generous, and giving mother and father of the land, providing all that you need. You think of them as your parents and you are their children. Another exciting discovery that I have made is that the tribes and eventually countries are named after titles of these indigenous deities. The tribes of old Europe viewed the earth as their mother and father. Think of the expression, the motherland, the fatherland. Our ancestors believe that quite literally. So which is more likely that all these countries are named after all these various things, the black people, ice, woodland, or all these countries are named after their father and mother God, the earth. We would have a tribe that called their deities Germania and German. And since they were Germania's children, they called themselves the Germanic tribe, and hence they founded Germany. If they worshiped the goddess under the name of Valonia and her partner Velez, or it can be spelled with a W, Velez and Velonia, then they became the Vlach or Wallachians. 
Osteia and Oseklis looked after their people, the Austrians. The tribes of Ingvones can be translated as the followers of the law of Ing. Their parent deities are Ing and Inga. And other followers of the goddess Ing and Inga probably settled in England. This goes for other countries as well. Ireland was once called Eri, and their mother earth goddess is Eru, whose name holds the meaning of earth, land of abundance, or can even be perceived as fat land, which helps put into perspective all those round goddess figures. In Slavic lands, oaths were sworn by kissing the ground or even swallowing a lump of earth. Mother Earth was considered to be pregnant in the early spring, so it was taboo to sprit, spit or strike the ground then. We also have Baba stones that would mark the entrance to a town or the border of lands, and the figure should be kissed upon your first visit to honor this bit of Mother Earth. This is my friend, Dr. Palua, kissing the Grobnik Baba stone. My main point here is to help you unlearn the common perception that nature spirits turned into deities. Instead, first we have the original divine both that divided into male and female. Then the male and female split into their summer form and their winter form. I've shown you how they've become known by different titles based on the type, time of the year transforming them into maiden, mother, and crone, as well as youth, father, and elder. But each of these titles had their helping spirits and mortal devotees that often went by the same name. The spirits that helped Deva and Devach are known as Devas, which are remembered in India. Mortal maidens who do rain dances to petition Purun and Puranika to bring rain are known as purpurunas. Valonia and Velez, keepers of the underworld, have the fairy-like spirits known as Vila. Mora and Moravit have their helping wise ones, the witches known as Mora or Mara, and the spirits known as Mora and so on. So congratulations, you now have a much better understanding of the indigenous deities, spirits, and tribes of old Europe. Now most folks understand how our languages multiplied from the common root of Proto-Indo-European. I would like you to understand that our concept of the divine couple also branched out like a tree. Each face of the divine accumulating different titles in different languages. And each of these deities have proliferated along with their land spirits and their mortal devotees. Those mortal devotees are all those wise ones we mentioned, witches, shaman, pagan priests, priestesses, Kaltos, Vedma, Volva, and so forth. So let's go back to the goddess in her dual form of Veli Diva or Valonia. In Lithuania, they celebrate the holiday of Velia or Velenez. This is the feast of the dead, the beginning of November. At this holiday, the goddess Valonia is invited to partake of the dead feast. Her name is rooted in an Indo-European word, vel, meaning the dead. Her spirits are the winged vila. You may have heard them from Harry Potter. In other cultures, they transformed into the winged Valkyrie of Norse lore, carrying off the fallen heroes to the land of the dead. In Old Norse, valar means the slain. These winged beings are also the origin of the Celtic fairies, the winged angels of Jewish and Christian lore. 
the diva of India, and the winged genie of Babylonia. <clears throat> now, Polonia and Velez and their summertime incarnations as Jiva and Jibug were connected to the snake. The snake slithered on the ground, and so it picked up a lot of earth energy called Jivat. In Lithuania, the snake is called Jaltis, which is close to another title of the earth goddess, Jemain, from Jeme, meaning earth. This goddess could shape change into a snake or dragon, which is just a winged snake. One of Valonia's other titles was Egli, the queen of the serpents. Now, eventually, Valonia is vilified and blamed for preying on children and women in childbirth, as well as tempting and sexually exhausting men in the night. One last thing I want to squeeze in here is Veli Diva's connection to ancient Mesopotamia. When a name is taboo to say, people use a variation of the name. For example, instead of cursing by God's blood, people would say Od's blood. An exclamation by God's body becomes Od's bodkin. And dam becomes darn. So the name shifts in different ways. Veli or Velonia became Babala or Babylonia, and her partner Velez became Vabel, as in Vabel Hill in Krakow, Poland, and their tale of the Vabel dragon. His name also became Babel, just like the Tower of Babel. <clears throat> we see Velonia in Slovenian folk tales called the Babylonian snake queen, or just the snake queen. Her title of Babilia transformed into Lilith. In Hebrew lore, Lilith is seen as the sister to Eve. One viewed as bad, the other is good. Lilith is also said to prey on children and women in childbirth, as well as being a succubus. Lilith is sometimes even depicted as the snake that tempted Eve. So that got me wondering, what does the name Eve mean? Lo and behold, it means life or the mother of all life, just like Shiva. And Adam, what does his name mean? It derives from the Hebrew word Adama, meaning ground or land revealing Adam connecting to the pagan earth father. In a way, the story of Babel has a type of poetic truth. It was once agriculture developed, creating walled towns and kingdoms that people began to stay in one place and they kept outsiders out. This led to the division of languages while the common indigenous beliefs that started in the Paleolithic divided into the major Western religions and a few Eastern ones as well, leaving traces of their commonalities. In the book, The Golden Bough, Sir James George Fraser pointed out the similarities of deities, but he just didn't know why Hopefully, now you understand why, because they all started from the same indigenous belief at the crossroads of old Europe. And just as understanding evolution needs a grasp of how long ago the common ancestor existed, so too you need to realize that these beliefs go back many tens of thousands of years to a common origin. I hope this now excites you as well. It is my hope that by recognizing our common roots and beliefs in a generous and all-giving mother and father earth, that we might live in harmony with the earth again. <clears throat> <clears throat>